Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. What's up, everyone? I'm Brian Carroll, and I'm here to help people move more, eat well, and be adventurous. I hope you're having a happy new year, and I hope you have some amazing health goals that you are trying to achieve this year. Uh, Some word of advice when it does come to health goals is to take it slow and easy. Many people coming into the new year really try to go all in and try to change too much too quickly, and oftentimes that does not stick. So if you are trying to reach these goals, really try to dial down what it takes to get to those goals so that they are easy goals that you can actually be successful with and you can see the progress as you're going through. So if you do have a huge goal that you're trying to start with, really break it down into actionable steps first and give yourself different uh, goal points that you're trying to reach along the way. That way, once you do reach those different goal posts, those points along your journey, Uh, you can do something for yourself and give yourself a little celebration on your journey. And also recognize that there will be ups and downs in your journey, and that is completely natural, and it's part of the process. So don't get discouraged if you do end up in some of those downs. And if you do kind of fall off the bandwagon, start fresh, reload yourself, and start right back up and get right back on that bandwagon And again, make some small actionable goals that you can be successful with so that you can dive right back in and get right back on track. So that's my little advice for the new year for you. And hopefully that'll help you to reach your goals more succinctly and you'll be more successful with everything. Now for myself, over the last couple of years, I made some pretty good progresses with my own health goals. Um, I know a lot of you either have your own business so you know what it's like to run a business or you have very time demanding careers and you probably understand how you can lose track of time very quickly and stuff get, kind of gets pushed to the side. So there was definitely times with in my own business where I put less focus on my own uh, fitness goals and my own nutrition goals, etc. And in the last two years, I've really kind of dialed all that back in and got right back on track with all that so that I could be back at the position where I want to be. And you've probably heard me talk about it before in uh, other podcast episodes where I call it a baseline, where I always want to be at this foundational baseline where if there is a bigger objective I'm trying to do, it doesn't take me that long to uh, be able to be ready for that objective. So if For instance, if I'm trying to do a big backpacking trip or a big um, something that requires a lot of uh, physical exertion, I'm at a baseline where I'm probably two to three weeks out if I put a lot of focus and a lot of training effort into being able to do those bigger objectives. So that's where I what I call the baseline. So if you are trying to figure out a baseline for yourself, think about um what it takes to get to a point where you feel really good, you're in really good shape, um, but you're not so strict about your protocol with your fitness regimen that uh, it takes up all of your time. So like for me, I can exercise four-ish days a week and I'm right there at that baseline. Um, And for some people, they might just need a couple days of exercise a week to be at their own baseline. Now, I do recommend moving every single day. It just doesn't necessarily have to be super high intensity or anything like that. But find your baseline that you would like to be at. That way, when the time comes where something might uh, be a little bit above the level that you're currently at, it won't take you that long to actually get there. And that baseline is usually where you feel pretty good and you feel like you can pretty much accomplish anything with just a little bit more effort. So with that being said, I'm going to up the ante a little bit on my baseline this year because I have some pretty big climbing goals that I want to achieve, um, mountaineering goals, etc., which means probably starting next month in February, I'm going to start doing um, a more structured fitness routine for myself 
to prepare myself for those mountaineering expeditions. And in, if you are interested in that process, I'm probably going to be documenting it um, with weekly vlogs or something like that over on YouTube. So if you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, then head on over to uh, youtube.com slash summit for wellness. And we have a bunch of stuff over there that you can go check out. But that's kind of one of my plans that I'm thinking about doing this year is to document some of that, the training type of stuff that I do and share it with everybody as well. And I know that's a little bit different than the podcast, but trying to spice things up a little bit and I keep stuff fresh. And I know a lot of people are very interested in my own regimens that I follow as well. So I think that would be pretty neat to share with all of you. Now, overall in 2021, I was able to be pretty successful with a lot of the goals that we talked about back in 2020 on different things we were going to do with a podcast. So this year we had quite a few uh, types of topics that we were talking about, a wide variety of guests, which I like to do. And then on top of that, we added in the video component, which um, so if you want to see video components of the podcast with myself and my guests, then again, that's all over on YouTube or in the show notes for every single episode. Um, because we added the video component into the podcast, we didn't release podcasts as often this year as we did in previous years. And I'm kind of fine with that because we averaged about one episode every other week. And with all the other stuff I've been doing, that seems to be a pretty good schedule. Now, I do have quite a few episodes already lined up for 2022, and I haven't really set a strict schedule for that. I don't know if it's going to be once a week, once every other week, or if it's kind of going to be in spurts where we release like 10 episodes over 10 weeks and then take a couple week break. You'll see whenever new episodes pop up in your podcast player. But once I figure out exactly the schedule I want to follow this year, then I'll be pretty consistent with it, as you've seen in previous years. Now, speaking of videos, over in the YouTube land, we released 80 videos this year, which is pretty significant for us considering we just started doing videos a year ago. So 80 videos is what, like one every four and a half days or five days or something like that. So we've released quite a few videos this year. Um, a lot of them are podcast related and also a lot of them are different adventure related. So the adventures that my wife Sarah and I go on, we've been documenting those and putting those on YouTube. So if you are looking for motivation or inspiration or anything um, to get yourself outside, then head on over to the YouTube channel. We got lots of videos on that. But enough talking about everything. This episode is all about the top five episodes from 2021. We do this every single year where we take the most downloaded episodes uh, from the year and share those with you in a top five countdown. Now, we only take downloads from the first month that the episode is released so that everything is on the same time scale. So in order to fit that into the year, we go from December episodes to December episodes that way, all the episodes are out for at least one month. But there is a little bit of a surprise this year because we had two different episodes that tied for fifth place. So even though this is a top five countdown, there will actually be six episodes this year. So with that, let's dive right into the top five episodes from 2021. Number five. So coming in tied at fifth place is episode 164 with Dr. Philip Ovedia, and it was all about how to stay off the cardiologist's operating table. In this episode, Dr. Ovedia is a cardiologist, and he was teaching us all about different things that he's learned to stay off of his operating table. Now, he's done roughly three to 4,000 open heart surgeries in his lifetime so far, which is quite a few, and... Over that time, he has learned a lot of things that lead to heart disease, and he wanted to share with us how to prevent heart disease and just take care of your heart so that he doesn't have to have you on his operating table. You Hopefully, you don't want to get to that point where you are on the table, and you can take some of this advice from someone with their hands deep in the industry and learn from him. So let's go listen to a little snippet from that episode. So your own experience has really helped you to not only connect with the patients that are coming in to see you, but you've also recognized that 
you know, some of these teachings that we've had for 40 years might not be working the way that they're supposed to for our society, uh, which part of that has led to heart disease being the number one uh, cause of death in our country, which I find absolutely fascinating. So what was the first thing that you discovered was one of the main issues leading to uh, people gaining weight and having heart disease? Well, you know, even to take a step back, I want to say that the first thing, you know, that this experience taught me was that what we eat is the primary determinant of our health. And much of the time, you know, in healthcare, in medicine these days, that fact gets lost. You know, we essentially believe that we develop diseases because of a lack of medication. And therefore, the reason to fix, you know, the primary way to fix these diseases is by treating people with medication. And, you know, realizing that what we eat has such an influence on our health, and therefore the best way to fix problems with our health, the first way to fix problems with our health, should be focusing on what we eat. So that, that was kind of the first concept I had, a sort of, I had to relearn. And then the next concept was, again, that it's not how much we eat necessarily, it's the types of food that we are eating that have the greatest influence on whether we become obese and whether we develop these chronic medical problems like heart disease that, you know, are the leading causes of death uh, for us. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, medication definitely has a place. There's definitely instances where medication is needed. But I also think that our society is so trained for a pill fixing all of our problems, and it's very hard for people to make big lifestyle changes like changing their diet. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I think in the end, it's not that hard for people if you give them a change that works. Mm -hmm. I think it is perceived that people you know, won't change your lifestyle or it's hard for them to change your lifestyle because largely the advice that they have been given around changing their lifestyle is lousy advice and it doesn't work. So obviously people aren't going to stick with it if it doesn't work. When I now talk to people and I I explain to them the types of, you know, dietary interventions that I usually recommend, dietary changes, and the other lifestyle factors that go into it. And I tell them, you know, the options are you can address, you know, let's say it's high blood pressure that they've been diagnosed with. And you can either go on this medication, and we know that you're going to be on this medication for the rest of your life. And most likely, you're going to need even more medications after this to continue to treat this problem. And the problem itself, the high blood pressure, isn't actually going to go away. We're just going to manage it with these medications. Or you can change some things about the way you eat and the way you live your life, and you won't need medications, and we can make the problem go away. We can actually undo the high blood pressure that you have, for instance. When you present that information to to people like that, ninety percent of people are going to say, "You know, I want to change. I want to do the lifestyle changes and avoid the medication if I can." And then, if you give them effective information on how to change their lifestyle, most of the time they really don't have trouble sticking with it. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that conversation usually doesn't even take place. They usually go to their doctor. And the doctor diagnoses them with high blood pressure, and they are told the only option is to take medications. And so that's what they do. And then, you know, we kind of, as a healthcare system, say, well, people just won't change their lifestyle, so we're not even going to bother talking to them about that. Again, that episode with Dr. Ovedia is episode 164. And if you ever want to know the quick way to get to the show notes for an episode, all you have to do is take the website, summitforwellness.com, add a slash, and then add the episode number, and that will take you right to the show notes. So his was episode 164. So you go to summitforwellness.com slash 164 to see all the show notes and resources for that episode.
And now the other episode tied for fifth place is episode 159, Peptide Therapy and How to Use It for Recovery and Performance with Dr. Amber Krogsrud. And in this episode, we all talk all about the different peptide therapies that you can use via injections and other methods and how it can be used for recovery processes, sport performance, and sexual health and sexual function. And here is a little clip with Dr. Amber. Now let's transition away from like sport performance and etc. And then let's talk about sexual function. Can peptides be used to improve sexual function, uh, in improve uh, circulation, sensitivity, etc.? Yes. Yeah, and there's a few that can be helpful here. So there's this system of the brain that's called the melanocortin system. And many people probably haven't heard about that, that system, but it really governs uh, our, it does govern libido, but it also governs our melanin in our skin, which is the pigmentation that causes our skin cells to get darker, governs our appetite, uh, can have some anti-inflammatory, has some impacts on our uh, immune system as well. Uh, so it, it plays a role in all of these different systems, but it does govern uh, libido. And, and so there's a few different peptides. There's really three main peptides that affect this system of the body, that melanocortin system. And the one that's really used for men and women for uh, either sexual dysfunction or uh, just wanting to improve uh, their experience is this peptide that's called bremelanotide, or PT-141. And it is an injection. There is an intranasal version of it that you can use as well. And it actually works uh, differently than Viagra. So Viagra works on the blood flow, and PT-141 bremelanotide works on the central nervous system. So for people who are too stressed and in too sympathetic of a state, they can't get into that parasympathetic rest and digest state, which you really need to be in uh, for arousal. And so it works differently. And, and that's why it can be really helpful for maybe the person who is really high strung and, and <laughs> has a low libido because they're so stressed, right? That's where it can be really helpful. There's a couple other peptides that also fit into that melanocortin system. One of them is called melanotan-1, and the other one's called melanotan-2. And those are really specific. They do have a libido-boosting element, uh, but they, they have a more specific function for increasing the melanin in the skin, which causes this tanning uh, presentation. So your skin will actually get tanner. I like to call those the tropical vacation peptides because they, they mimic what you would experience if you went to Fiji. Uh, your immune system improves, your you know, skin's less inflamed, your appetite decreases, your libido is better, you get tan. So uh, that, one, that one's kind of nice, but it does have more of a mild libido boosting property, whereas PT-141 is very specific. You take it right before sex. It's very specific for, for that function. Now, that was a really fun episode with Dr. Amber, and there's a lot of different ways to use peptides to improve just performance, sleep, etc. And so you can learn more about all of that at summitforwellness.com slash 159. And there's some resources in there to some of the different peptides that she mentioned in that episode. Number four. Coming in at number four is episode 155, Telomere Length and Impacts on Aging with Doc Misak. And in this episode, we talked specifically about how to lengthen your telomeres, which are the endpoints of your genes. And what has been shown in research is as you start to age, then those endpoints of your genes start to shorten. And uh, it kind of makes your genes start to fall apart a little bit. So in this episode, we talk about how to take care of those genes and try to lengthen those telomeres so it, it, the ends of your genes are more solid and don't fall apart as easily. So here's a little snippet from that episode. I don't know a whole lot about telomeres, so I'm really excited to learn from you about what telomeres are. So can you tell us what are telomeres? Well, Just like a quick well, and dirty example of it. Telomeres are um, on the end of your DNA, you know, within your chromosomes. Um, they're they're the part of the DNA that, re for, in regards to replication, 
you know. And so, and it says, hey, we're going to keep making this because this is healthy. You know, it's going to make the best possible DNA that it can. But as telomeres shorten, um, our DNA ability to replicate diminishes and dies off. You, but they, what they found is that telomere shortening is directly associated with aging, period. As telomere shorten, you age, period. And in 2009, the Nobel Prize of Medicine was won by three physiologists. Look it up, 2009 Nobel Prize. And these three physiologists discovered an enzyme called telomerase, telomere ACE, A-S-E. If you ever look at enzymes in your, in your in digestive enzymes or systemic enzymes, all of them end in A-S-E. It, it's an enzyme, right? So telomerase is an enzyme that as it's high in amount, it prevents telomeres from shortening. And as they shorten, we age. And so these, these uh, physiologists showed that, hey, if we stimulate this enzyme, we have prematurely aged mice, white hair, arthritic, cataracts, kidney failure, senile, couldn't get through mazes. We stimulated the enzyme, and not just did telomeres not shorten, but they anti-aged the mice. Their hair got dark, their joint pain went away, their kidney failure went away, their, um, uh, their brains actually on autopsy grew by 25%. You know, uh, so, you know, so they literally reverse age these mice. So, oh my God. So I'm, I'm in, um, I, I, how do things work? Greatest anti-aging discovery ever. Okay. Pharmacy background, uh, compounding pharmacy background. I did telomere research and found like, wow, uh, there are natural products that stimulate telomerase activity. I looked, okay, are there any products on the market that do this? And there was one, it's expensive as crap that had uh, cycloestragalinol and astragalicide, I, astragalicol, astragalicide 4, two um, astragalus extracts in it. And if you were taking the doses that they were claiming that shortened, that prevented telomeres from shortening, it could cost you like $2,000 a month. So rich and famous, oh, wow. stay short, stay, stay anti-aging, right? So I turned around and from a naturopathic standpoint and from a pharmacist standpoint, um, I formulated a product called Vitalometry. And so what I did is I looked at all these um, um, different types of uh, um, uh, products, mostly herbs, that were showing telomerase activity. And I said, okay, if these herbs all have telomerase activity, why hasn't anybody taken herbs that all have telomerase activity and use them in a, in a way that just supports the body? And I'm, that's what made sense to me from a naturopathic doctor, pharmacist standpoint. So astragalus, uh, those extracts, the cycloastragalinol, astragaliside 4, I put them in there, but not in those high amounts. But then I used astragalus um, because it has been shown that. But what's astragalus do? Adrenal support, immune support, um, um, supports the liver, adrenal glands, those type of things. Uh, milk thistle, heard about that? Who hasn't? Liver support, right? Still also has telomerase activity. Um, ginkgo. Okay, wait a minute. These brains grew by 25%. Well, what if I enhance circulation to the brain, right? With ginkgo, keep the blood thin, a little bit of a uh, um, small amount of uh, blood thinning ability so the blood flow goes improves well. Um, but get blood flow. But it also had um, uh, telomerase activity. Uh, purslane, a weed in your garden. Most people pull it and throw it away. But it's the richest source of omega-3 fatty acids. And what do omega-3 fats do? Every cell membrane has healthy fats. Your brain, mostly healthy fat. Let's improve the ability and translocation of minerals and nutrients across the cell membranes by giving healthy fats. Also, purslane, telomerase activity. Um, there's an herb called Sinomorium. It's a, it's a Chinese yang tonic. Um, and uh, it... Um, it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's known for sexual vitality um, and strong amount, again, telomerase activity, but it gives you that energy without having that, that wiry kind of uh, uh, caffeine effect. And then uh, a lot, you also, if you go and get the book on telomeres, it's called The Telomere Effect by one of, by uh, Elizabeth Blackburn. Um, she was one of the three physiologists and she wrote a book. And she talks about antioxidants having and poor lifestyle. We could talk about that too. But antioxidants. And so green tea, 
most powerful, one of the ellagic acids, one of the most powerful antioxidants out there, shown to have um, anti-cancer effect, um, so shown to help uh, metabolism and, and digestion aspect, cardiovascular health. Um, again, telomerase activity, resveratrol and uh, elderberry. Again, well, let's support our immune system. Also, telomerase activity, right? And then that bioelectric chemistry stuff that I teach, um, you have to have, if you look at electric aspect of what we are, <clears throat> you have sodium and potassium starting electric potentials going mostly through calcium channels, and calcium regulates the movement of all minerals in and out of the cells. So I put some calcium phosphate in there called Mencol, um, and I put a little bit of lemon. Uh, because lemon is completely anionic in nature. Everything in nature is positive and negative charges, cations and anions. And anions disperse, right? So I, And so lemon's fully anionic. I, when you teach bioelectric chemistry, you have to be drinking lemon as part of your regimen. But um, it also, what about lemons and vitamin C and antioxidant activity and stuff like that? So I put this stuff together. I started mixing these powders from a pharmacy, compounding pharmacy, making these capsules, taking them. I'm like, oh my God, do I really feel this good? So I asked my clients, uh, would you like to try something? And they're like, are you asking me to be a experiment, Dr. Misak? And I'm like, um, that's up to you. I'll give you some capsules. Every one of them. Can I get more of these? All of them asked me, you know, and uh, any negative effect? No, I feel great. Can I, would you sell me some of these? Like, no, but within a year and a half, you know, I turned around and came up with uh, Vitalometry, put it on the market, and it took off from there. Uh, my favorite story from Vitalometry is my dog, uh, Clara. You know, I had a 13-year-old lab, and um, she was losing bladder control. She was peeing around the house. She was walking. She she never went out of the yard. She knew the boundaries. You could just let her out. She'd go out, and she'd come back in. Next thing you know, I had people like, did you know your dog's in the middle of the road? No. Do you know your dog's across the street? No. She was losing, becoming senile. She couldn't make it up the stairs. My wife was like, we need to put her down. I'm like, you know what? Let me try one thing first. So I took the ingredients from, um, from Vitalometry and I mixed them with uh, hydrolyzed collagen because, you know, joint issues and nail and skin health. And she was having that. And next thing you know, my dog's playing like a puppy. And not only that, she lived to be 15 years old, still able to walk up the stairs, still able to make it to the door and say, I got to the bathroom. You know, she was still slow. I mean, 15-year-old purebred lab, but still, you know, she was a happy dog, right? And, um, and we ran, I ran out of making her product, and, um, and, and I didn't bring it home within like a week, and she just started going downhill so fast, peeing couldn't make up, fell down the stairs. My wife's like, I'm not going through this again. And I'm like, I agree. And, and we, at that point, we chose to have her put down, you know? Again, you can check out more about episode 155 at summitforwellness.com slash 155. And there's a lot of resources in that show as well. Number three. Coming in at number three is a fan favorite on the Summit for Wellness podcast, and that is episode 143 with Cynthia Thurlow on how to break through your weight loss plateau. So that's a perfect episode if you want to learn how to break through those sticky points in your weight loss journey where it just seems like you can't lose any more weight, then this episode is for you. So here's a little snippet from Cynthia. Do you think... Uh, with leptin resistance, part of that could be because someone has um, more body fat on their bodies that when they're eating, they have more storage sites for extra nutrients. Um, I mean, that could certainly be part of it. I mean, we know that um, they're not getting those satiety cl clues. And so obviously, if you're 100 pounds overweight, you're going to have more leptin resistance than someone who has 10 pounds of weight to lose. Um, you know, subjectively, we, we know that based on research. So just something for people to understand that it's not just in your head that you're struggling to like remind yourself, like I'm full, like that's like eating for satiety is one of the most important things that we can learn because once, you know, that's like the baby step first, like we need to eat for satiety because when we perceive we're full, we will stop eating. Like when we're really full, like that's why, you know, protein and healthy fats should fill you up more than just eating carbs, like carbs, they just don't register. And I know I trigger people when I say this, but our body can make 
carbohydrates from protein. It's a process called gluconeogenesis. So we technically don't need carbs, although carbs are fun. We enjoy eating carbs. We want to occasionally have a piece of bread or cracker, et cetera. I get it. I totally get it. However, we don't need carbs. We do need protein and fats. We cannot make those on our own. Yeah. And um, speaking about satiety as well, it takes time for that to register. So mm -hmm. if you're just scarfing food down, that's not going to occur because it hasn't been enough time. So it's what, about 20 minutes, maybe Typically once you 20, start eating food? Yep, 20 minutes. And I always like to remind people that when we're stressed, so if you're standing and eating or eating in the go or eating in your car or yelling at your kids or whatever, yelling at your spouse, really important that your body perceives you are in a relaxed frame of mind because just think about it like digestion starts in our brains which we all know but we don't secrete so so we don't secrete enough hydrochloric acid if we aren't secreting enough hydrochloric acid our body is not not is then not primed to secrete um healthy amounts of bile it's not ready to detoxify our body it's not going to secrete as much pancreatic enzymes so we are not going to be able to digest our food properly and break it down break it down then digest it uh, if we're not in that right frame of mind. And so when I'm talking to people and they're struggling to lose weight, I'm like, well, what do you tell me what you do when you eat lunch? And it's usually like I'm multitasking. I'm working, I'm eating, I'm doing, I'm yelling, I'm walking my dog. And I'm like, no, 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 you need to sit. You need to, and I tell my husband this all the time because uh, he tends to be a stander and eater in the middle of the day. I'm like, I don't care if you stand outside, if you sit and you stare outside and look at a tree for 10 minutes, your body really genuinely needs to know that you are relaxed and safe so it can digest your food. That's another thing is that we're, we're so conditioned to like eat on the go and we eat really fast. We don't even register that we're full. And I think that can be hugely problematic for many, many people because they're not getting these satiety cues. And when you're not satiated, you don't stop eating. That's the biggest takeaway message. And so when people say, oh, I want to do intermittent fasting, I'm like, okay, we need to learn how to eat first. We need to learn how to fuel our bodies and become satiated so that when we move on to the next piece, our, we're actually mentally and physically ready for that. Again, that was episode 143. And you can find all the resources at summitforwellness.com slash 143. And Cynthia, I'm sure you recognize that name. She's been on the show multiple times. And I think back in 2019, I think she was uh, episode of the year um, with us back in, I think, 2019. So go check out some of those episodes too, because every episode with her has been phenomenal. Number two. Coming in at number two is episode 153, How to Reduce Anxiety and Mental Health Challenges with Carol Garner Houston. And of course, that is the perfect episode for the last couple of years because there are so many people that are struggling with anxiety, with everything going on, and mental health conditions. And so, of course, that episode was very well received by everybody that listened to it. And uh, let's go ahead and listen to a snippet from that episode. Obviously, we're going through a pandemic, and uh, we've seen a lot of people struggle with all sorts of different mental challenges. And uh, one of those challenges is anxiety. And it seems like a lot of people have anxiety mm -hmm. now. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, anxiety levels were rising. What percentage would you say of people had anxiety or were dealing with anxiety? And how has that changed since the pandemic? I, I love how you phrased that question um, because it really gives us an in-depth look of, of what's happening with anxiety over time and this unique circumstance that, that we're all, like, we've been all experiencing. We've served thousands of clients, and before the pandemic, about 70% reported anxiety as a comorbidity, right? Um, since the pandemic, we have about 90% of our friends have anxiety as a pain point, as well as the severity of the anxiety has increased. And so, but the good thing is, is that we have these, you know, rock star tools that are such accelerants of organizing the brain and nervous system that really we can change that trajectory, you know, very specifically. So um, it makes sense though, on why there's so much anxiety with the pandemic, right? The pandemic's been chaos to our nervous systems with anxiety, you know, just bubbling to the surface. And it's understandable with, you know, unprecedented isolation, separation from family and friends, 
fear of disease, uh, dependence upon screens, right, for education and replacing socialization patterns, unpredictable schedules. And to me, the worst part was the physical movement restrictions, right, where people telling us where we couldn't go and what we couldn't do. That's a lot of chaos for the nervous system. And quite honestly, you know, it reminds me of those experiments in the 50s and 60s that we learned about in like our Psych 101 classes where they took the sweet baby monkeys and the scientists uh, imposed sensory deprivation environments by removing the baby monkey from their mother. They were isolated in cages and given dolls made out of wire to replace the mother. When these little monkeys were raised in isolation, away from their mothers, away from peers, away from snuggles and safe touch, they presented with well-documented and predictable neurological changes. Crippling withdrawal, agitation, self-mutilation, cognitive decline, stagnation, regression in function, and starving themselves to death. Isn't that so similar to what we're all experiencing now? And when we're exposed to these, you know, sensory deprived environments over long periods, let's say, just like you mentioned, a 16, this past 16 months, it begins to change the brain and our ability to function as intended. But it's not that bad because it's the same principles of neuroplasticity can apply. If we can change the brain into that disorganized state based upon the environment and what we expose ourselves to, then we can change the brain in a positive direction just by changing what we feed our nervous system. And that's what we get excited about teaching our clients and our friends is how that process can be done um, and how you can take control back over you know, how you're feeling and functioning. I think there are a lot of valuable nuggets from that episode that people can take and use. Um, even if you don't really think that you have any issues with anxiety or mental health, but some of the processes that she walks us through is just good overall um, practice for our brains and our mental health so that when we do come across these different challenges, we are ready for them and we can get past them without feeling like we're stuck or lost. Number one. Coming in at the number one spot for a podcast of the year on the Summit for Wellness podcast is episode 165 with Terry Cochran, Using Your Genetic Blueprint to Optimize Health. Now, in this episode, we talk with Terry all about how to uh, take a sample of your genes, look at some of the different genetic blueprints that you have, and figure out what nutrients are better for you, what foods are better for you, and how to really adapt a diet that is specific to your body's needs. So let's go learn a little bit from her on how she gets that done. When people are first coming to you and you do the genetic blueprint, are you also doing anything, any other testing, such as a food sensitivity test to see what they're currently having issues with? Or are you just going off of the blueprint? Well, we look at the blueprint, but we also test food as part of our applied kinesiology and the blueprint goes to food. So, um, and we've, you know, we've helped people that we've never even met because we do see people from across the world um, that as long as we have their genetic blueprint and we've tied it to their symptomology, we can get very, very accurate in terms of how you should eat and supplement because it's not just about the food, it's about supplementation. So for example, we had someone who had life-threatening psoriasis where almost her entire body was a tree trunk. Her, her skin was so significantly rough. It was going into her lungs. She was, she had been to the Mayo Clinic. She had been to New, some of the top New York doctors. Um, they were saying it was a liver, it was a liver malfunction and they were giving her glutathione IVs. Now glutathione is very popular in the world of functional medicine. Well, in her case, glutathione was a poison because she had multiple SNPs that related to inability to process sulfur and glutathione is a sulfur compound. Mm. So any foods and any supplementation, pharmaceutical or not, became a poison in her system. And when we discerned that, this incurable condition was gone. So we have to look at, for example, another one which is really uh, interesting, which m- many people don't know and, and very touted in the world of functional medicine is, is curcumin or turmeric. Turmeric has been known as an anti-cancer, as an anti-inflammatory, as a liver detoxifier. It's just great. Well, if you have the CYP2D6 polymorphism, 
that can become a pro-inflammatory, a pro-oxidant, and back up your liver because it can reduce your detoxification pathway by up to 50%, 50, not 5%, not 15, but 50. That's a problem. I know because I have that gene. <laughs> and if I eat turmeric a lot, it's gonna tell me that I'm not gonna feel very good at all. I'm gonna feel terrible. So, and people don't understand, and they're saying, I'm taking, I had one client, she'd come to me first time, Terry, I don't understand. I've put on 15 pounds over five weeks. My thyroid is completely off. I'm not doing anything differently. What am I, this is a new client. So we really started, because you have to ask the right questions. We say, if you ask the right questions, the right answers will follow. And I said, okay, well, walk me through your day and tell me exactly what you do as you eat. And so she said, well, I start my day with turmeric tea. I've been drinking it five times a day. We checked her genetics. Oh my gosh, you have this gene. It's been expressed. You are, your lymphatic system can't hold it. You're going fluffy because your liver is so backed up and the liver is telling the lymph, hey, deal with it. And the lymph is going, we can't. Because she also had some fat metabolism issues. Well, she came back, everything was beautiful. Six weeks later, we do a, a six week follow-up. So it's, sometimes it's that simple. That one thing is just like the tipping point that throws you into a rabbit hole that you become mystery illness, but it wasn't that mysterious. Not to us at least. I had a really great time talking to Terry all about how to use genes to create a blueprint specifically for your body. And if you wanna learn more about how that is done, then head on over to summitforwellness.com slash 165. And you can see some of the resources that she provided on how to do that and how to get in contact with her and her team if you wanna dive deeper into that as well. So there you have it. That's our top five podcast episodes from 2021. And now we are making our way into 2022 and we will be having more episodes coming out in next week. Next week we'll have episodes all about um, working on your fascia, which is the tissues in your body and how to stay pain free by different movement patterns and breathing exercises, etc. So until then, keep climbing to the peak of your health.